couple topics today. First of all, Africa as a topic of far as investment, companies, kind of why it's getting so much buzz in the media today. Um, we're going to talk about kind of the legacy of imperialism and what it means for Africa today. We'll look at kind of the largest companies in the world today in 2014. And then finally, we'll kind of end with a little economics 101, considering that none of you are seniors, you haven't taken economics class, and this is a business class or a club, maybe we need a little bit of a economics 101. So kind of the first question is, what is the capital of Africa? So take a moment and think about that. What's the capital of Africa? How many do you know? Uh, I, I think it's somewhere up north. I don't know. That, I, don't, I don't know. There is none. There is no capital of Africa because oh. why? There is no country. What is Africa? Partial. Like the matter of land. <laughs> it's a continent. Alright. Now, why do I bring this up? Because sometimes when we think about the world, Remember, Africa is a continent. You know, when, when a news story comes out and says, Africa has got a new century, or new investment in Africa, well, what are you talking about? Ebola. Because, well, yes, and of, unfortunately, Ebola is just in one area of Africa. No. It would be like us saying something's going on wrong in Canada, so that must be the United States. No, it just doesn't make sense. Those are two completely different countries. Um, issues in Mexico are the same as the United States. No, those are two different countries. And so with Africa, you have a continent with 53 different countries, all with their own ca capitals. You have 1.1 billion people, um, almost 2,000 different languages. There's different religions um, with their own histories, traditions, economics, politics, military, social structures, governments. Now, why do I bring this up? So when they talk about Africa in the news, remember, Africa is not just one con uh, country where everyone must be the same, where they're all running around with the lions and the tigers and in the Congo jungle. No, it's very much different in different parts of the regions. There's different environments. And so that's some of the stereotypes that we have to overcome as Americans when we look to Africa because Africa has become a interesting topic for economic or economists and some business investments. And so again, since it's a con con continent, not a country, how big is Africa? Do you have any idea? Very big. That's Compared to what? Is China bigger than Africa? No, well China's population is bigger than Africa. Is it like four times as big as Europe? Yeah. You could fit all the United States, India, New Zealand, Argentina, China, and all of Europe inside of Africa. That's how big Africa is. Which just means when we're looking for and there's discussions of investments in Africa, it's very complex. There may be oil fields in some parts, there may be gold and silver in others, there may be lots of agriculture and there may be none. There may be mountains, there may be deserts, there may be forests, and there may be jungle. And so just remember that going into this, today's discussion that Africa is a very complex region and so don't fall into those stereotypes. All right. Now, one of the reasons why I'm talking about Africa is because there there's been some discussions about Africa rising, a hopeful continent, an article that I read about um, Africa and investments. And so one of the things that are going on in Africa is today's current investments there. And so when we look to Africa and some of the skepticism of investment in Africa today is that they're starting to see some of the trends of maybe past imperialism. And so in Africa, there's a long legacy of the partition of Africa, all the way back to 1880s and early 1900s, where Europeans and, Ameri and, and other investors flocked to Africa to invest, but really it was this new form of imperialism where really they're looking to exploit the land for natural resources, new markets, you know, ports, fueling, all that good stuff. And so for the Africans, they didn't benefit from this original investment in the sense that they were able to develop their own companies, their own culture, their own kind of industry. It was mainly for European exploitation. And so when we think about this, one of the reasons why there are some worries by some of the Africans in, their, in this continent is that with this new flow of investment, Africa, and according to this document, the past 10 years, real income per person has increased by more than 30%. It's the world's fastest growing continent. And so a statistic like that, and with the investment of Europeans and with a 
increasing population. Africa may become a major player in the world in, in this century. Uh, one of the other things that's interesting about Africa is that in addition to foreign investments, there's starting to be the spread of democracy. Um, all these dark red colors are the expanding GDP average income of these countries as far as percentage wise. So which means all of these countries in Africa are increasing in GDP. And what is GDP? It's the gross domestic product. And all that means is, is everything your country is producing. It's the money that it's making. It's the, it's the production of your company. So higher GDP usually means something that's better for your economy. And so let me go back a little bit. And let me exit out of actually this for a second. Because when we look at this, let's go to a couple websites here. Um, Luis was, and, and I were talking about how Asia works. And it was a book that Bill Gates has given to many people about, can the Asian miracle happen in Africa? And so this is a question, you know, Asia, China, India, Southeast Asia, these, Japan, how fast have they industrialized and improved? And can this model work for Africa? And it's a good question. And according to this book, really to create an industrialized Africa, just like Asia did, there's three factors. You need to create conditions for small farmers to thrive. Okay. Then number two, use the proceeds from agriculture surplus to build a manufacturing base that is tooled from the start to produce exports. So which that, all that means is you need to get farmers to be able to produce enough so you can create, create some capital, create some money, then invest in your company and create products that you can export. Okay? Export means sell to other countries. And then nurture both these sectors, small farming and export oriented manufacturing, with financial institutions closely controlled by the government. Whether this is possible in Africa or not is going to be difficult because, like we just learned, Africa is very diverse. There are many different countries with different governments and different environments. And so maybe one of the issues compared to a country like China is that China is under the control of one Chinese government. Africa has many different governments. And so one of the issues with this could be the possibility that for Africa, this is not going to be possible. Now, Going back, those three kind of ideas of agriculture, create some surplus, create some exports, invest in your, your own country, has happened already. It was called the Industrial Revolution for Europe. And in Europe, in the 17, by 1750, the agricultural revolution in Europe had prospered. And Great Britain specifically, as we see with the blue line here, had a little bit of a head start. They were able to advance, to industrialize, to increase the average income per person ahead of the world. Eventually the world's going to catch up, and it's mainly because since 1970, countries like Asia, or sorry, continents like Asia and Africa have been able to catch up. And so this growth is an example of, in the past, just like in China and Asia and other Asian countries, that agriculture, then exports, and then investment into inventions is the best way to industrialize. So here's some factors for industrialization. You have natural resources, you have labor supply, you have capital, you need consumers, you, need you have technology, transportation, and stable government. If these things are available in the African countries, then you're able to then industrialize. Um, without these components, it's gonna be very difficult to industrialize. Natural resources, all this means is raw materials, yeah. coal, iron, waterways, okay? They do. They just, it's very complex and diverse. So in certain African country, countries, they might not have certain natural resources compared to others. That's why we don't always use the same blanket <coughs> statement of Africa. Labor supply, that just means humans to be able to work in the factories or in the fields. You need capital, money, you need consumers. You need people to buy the product. And going back to your discussion last week, and the presentation, you discussed the six principles of innovation. What were some of those six principles of innovation? Do you remember? From last week? Were any of you there? Well, let me help you out. Find something that isn't working or, and make it better. Okay? 
Well, that's easy enough. Always listen to your consumer. Keep it stupid simple. Be quick, but don't hurry. Business and innovation is both an art and a science, and you cannot be afraid to fail. Well, why I'm bringing this up is because with your consumer, you have to make a product that consumers want. All right? If you make a product that consumers don't want, you're not going to be able to sell that product. Then technology and transportation and stable government eventually will be able to foster some of this. And so when we look back all the way back to 1914, we see a perfect example of industry developing in the United States. And if we look at this chart, Great Britain, France, and Germany, these are investments, European investments in 1914. According to this chart, where is all this European money going to? What does it look like, Abraham? Hey, which one has the biggest arrow? Where's all this money going to? America. The United States. America. America. Can we guess why the United States may have had the largest economy after World War I? The United States is going to lead the world in economics and in politics and in militarily in the 20th century. And we see a model, once again, foreign investment into your country to develop may lead to prosperity. And so seeing all of these models, we look to Africa now, and we see the same trends, investments into Africa. Okay. Does this mean Africa is going to become the next United States? Does that mean, like some of the article, uh, some of the people in this article said that, you know, Africa is, this is going to be the new century for Africa? I don't know. However, one of the things that is going on in Africa is this, uh, that they are fearing that some of this new investment into Africa Maybe like the old imperialism. You know, why, are, why is China investing into Africa? Why is European and American companies investing into Africa? Is it to help the Africans and to help industry and to build infrastructure within their country? Or is it once again to build corporations within the country and the continent to then make sure that those companies make the most money? And so one of the fears for Africans is that these new form of investment is kind of be a new form of imperialism. And I bring this up because as we look to some of the largest and biggest companies in the world, none of them are really found in Africa. And so right now, I want to kind of take a shift away from Africa and take a look at some of the largest companies in the world today. So we'll watch. China takes over the top three spots, all right? Yes. Um, and many of them are banks, agricultural bank uh, based kind of companies, and construction. And so when you want to see a country that's industrializing and modernizing and growing, those are the companies, okay? Uh, again, you have the ICBC in China, Chinese Construction Bank, Agricultural Bank of China, and then we get to the United States. Uh, and so, when we come back to this, is you know we see this drastic development in China, and then one of the questions is, can this happen for the United States? I'm oh, sorry, for Africa. Where is it going? Technical difficulty. Why isn't there technical difficulty? There was a lot more information on this one. There it is. It's kind of low. So if we look now, advertisements. Lots of advertisements. If we look now, 
In 2000 and 2003, North America had by far almost 50% of the largest companies in the world. Asia, 532, just ahead of Europe. However, just since then, 2000 and 2014, come on. It's like Mason's class all over again. 2000 and 2014, we see China. We see Oceania. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. American bullion. All right. Anyways, so North America has now actually fallen behind Asia. So can the same trend happen in Africa? Uh, and as we look to it, one of the issues with Africa as a whole is that for some of them, one of the statistics talks about, um, according to the World Bank, the middle income, half of Africa's middle income, which means they're making about $1,000 per person. Now, in a continent as diverse as Africa, can we still see the same trends as China in Africa? You know, are we going to be able to invest? Are they going to continue to invest? Um, I know Bill Gates and his uh, foundation, it says that they invested $1.7 in Africa since 2006. And so the other issue that you got to understand about investment is that it takes time. These roads, these industries, these, these, these factories, it takes time for them to develop into something that maybe will look like China, maybe will look like Japan and the rest of Asia. And as we compare these two, you know, look at the legacy of imperialism, look at the legacy of their history and why China and Japan and Asia was able to industrialize so quickly in the last 50 years compared to Africa. And is this gonna be the new trend for Africa in the next 50 years with all this new investment? Um, having discussed that, if we look to Economics 101, I think for a business class it'd be kind of nice to take a look and understand exactly how does our economy work. So, what is our economic system in America? What do we have? Capitalism. And capitalism is a form of a market economy. Have you ever asked yourself why does a product cost the, the much, as much as it does? Like what? Who sets the price of a product? The supplier. The supplier. Both supplier and. And so one of the key components of economics is you got to understand something: supply <coughs> and demand. You know, if we're talking about the six principles of innovation, you need to make something that someone is willing to buy, and that comes from the demand. So you're willing to supply something. Is there a demand for it? And really, all demand really means is how much someone is and how desirable is something for that person at that specific price. Let's take an example of pizza, slice of pizza. Maybe here's the quality, quantity. One slice of pizza, two slices, three slices. The price, one, two, and three. At three dollars a slice, how many slices of pizza do you, you might want? Maybe one, because it's three dollars. What if the price of that pizza was only $2? Maybe you'd be willing to buy two. What if that slice of pizza was only $1? Would you be willing to buy it for three of them for the price of one? Mm -hmm. Because that same $3 now has a stronger value because now you can buy three slices of pizza. And so as this demand relationship is a downward slope because the higher the price, sorry, the higher the price, the less the consumer wants, okay? You're not going to demand a lot of $3 slices of pizza, but you may demand a lot of $1 slices of pizza. And that's from the consumer's perspective. From the seller's perspective, if you're going to start one day a company, you have to figure out, obviously the goal is to make a profit, to create something that someone wants, to help out the world, to improve society. But at some point, you still need to make money. And so for the supplier, you want to sell as many products for as most money as you possibly can. So for that pizza company, you want to sell three pieces of pizza for three dollars. You don't want to sell any pieces of pizza for a dollar because you're going to make less money. However, if no one is going to buy that slice of pizza for three dollars, at some point the supply and the demand curve hit. And that point is the equilibrium, which just means the consumer, right, 
the consumer the demand, and the supplier the company are willing to sell their product and buy that product at that price. And so for most people, it might be $2 for two slices, which then eventually means you could buy one for $1, two for two, etc. All right? And so when it comes down to supply and demand, and when you're looking for a product to improve upon something, you know, really think about that. When you're thinking about a product to make, first of all, you gotta think about the cost, production, but really, who wants to buy it and why? <coughs> and I bring that up because when we go back to Africa, you know, if Africa is such a large continent, so diverse, so complex, and there's all this new investment into Africa, you know, if you're really looking for a product and innovation to change the world and to really find new markets, one of the best ways to do that is to find something that maybe is a problem or a necessity or a need in one of these countries. Um, I know there's companies like Tom's Shoes. What's, the, what's kind of the selling point for Tom's Shoes? Those little shoes that they sell. You ever heard of them? No. For every pair you buy, they donate one to some third world country. Okay. Uh, well, that's the selling point. Well, what about in Africa where there's issues of water supply, <coughs> food production? If there's new corporations and new companies, you know, places like Africa, places that are developing, when we look for supply and demand, when we look for capital, when we look for investments and innovation, a need in the United States may have gone away because of an invention, but in other places of the world, they may have new problems, which require new inventions. And so when we look to Africa, we look to Asia, we look to the world as a whole, you know, there's always different trends. Um, I know one of the pro issues with many companies is you gotta do the research. What is going to be the next new big thing? What's gonna be the next problem? Um, for some people, it's the environment. We'll come up with a product that saves the environment and still makes the same product that you've been creating. These are the ideas that are going to lead to a better future for all of us. And they're also going to possibly make you lots of money. Um, as a business, you're going to need to make a product that someone needs. And so remember, as historically, um, historical evidence has shown, is that times have changed. The United States was once had all the top companies. Now it's shifting to Asia. Well, in the 21st century, are we going to have a new shift from United States, Asia, to now Africa? And so keep, a, keep your eyes open to kind of information about Africa because there's more and more investment. Um, there's lots of potential. And really, when we look at things, when we talk about the economy, remember, when you're making a product, when you're thinking of an idea, remember, it comes down to supply and demand. We have a market economy. The market dictates what's going to be good and what's not going to be good. Um, what's going to sell and what's not going to sell. And when you have the means of production like labor, capital, and land, this is the formula for success. Um, and so, kind of to recap, with new investments into Africa, some of the fears have been, is this the new form of imperialism? Others have said, nope, this is going to be a new form of Africa, a new type of investment and they're going to take over, they're going to be the new China. Well, we'll see, but in the end, think about when you're starting to develop kind of ideas for the world, it really is now a global world. Everything is interconnected, everything is moving faster and faster, and something that is a need in Africa can easily be now developed in America and then become something that is globally used for everyone. Uh, and so, big picture, the world is changing to make sure that the United States or whatever you believe in stays at the top. Remember, these things are needed. These things change all the time. And so in the end, uh, take, keep an eye open to kind of the global trends, not just in the United States, uh, but in Africa and in China and in the other places.